Heavy snow warnings have been issued for the upper Midwestern states. Expect cold and blistery weather this week as the storm center pushes itself into central Wisconsin. The first two days of Wisconsin's 10-day deer hunting season have claimed the lives of six hunters. Five died from accidental gunfire and one from a heart attack. Police are probing the grisly scene at the secluded farmhouse of Plainfield handyman Ed Gein, who admitted today that he disemboweled and butchered the body of 58-year-old widow Bernice Wharton. Authorities found the decapitated body hanging in Gein's woodshed, cut it out and strung up by the heels. Investigators have also discovered the head and face of 54-year-old Mary Hogan. Portions of the bodies of 10 or more people have also been found among the other grisly human body parts. 10 human skulls, furniture made of human skin, a box full of noses, tan skin from a human head, a belt made of female nipples, one small skull believed to be that of a six-year-old child. Authorities suspect cannibalism. <laughs> Sometimes we remember the 1950s through this kind of Ozzie and Harriet haze of nostalgia. In the 50s, we caught this sense that everything from now on was going to be all right. And it was like a drug. It was the era of Doris Day and all of these sappy, sentimental songs. It's very important in terms of putting, I think, the Gein story into context is the kind of very puritanical sexual code that prevailed at that time. You know, you have a culture in which, for example, on TV, married couples weren't allowed to be shown sleeping in the same bed. That made the Gein crimes horrendously startling to people. Ed Gein grew up in a small town, Plainfield, Wisconsin. Plainfield was an utterly nondescript, obscure place, really in the middle of nowhere. And the population has never been more than six to 800 people. That area of Wisconsin tends to be a very, very hard scrabble part of the state, sometimes referred to as the great dead heart of Wisconsin. The Geens lived a fairly good distance away from town. When you look at Geen's life, you just have the sense of incredible isolation from any human contact except with his crazy mother. He grew up in a household with an alcoholic and abusive father and a mother who was very domineering. She was fanatical in her religion and did not want uh, Ed or his brother Henry to have much to do with the outside world because there were sinners out there. Augusta Gein really smothered her two sons and denied them any meaningful relationships with the outside world and, and particularly with women. And also had extreme pathological aversion to anything to do with sex. So Ed grew up with this very, very powerful ambivalence towards his mother. On the one hand, he consciously worshipped and revered her and saw her as a godlike figure. But on another unconscious level, he inevitably developed this terrible resentment and hatred. There's an ongoing argument about whether sociopaths are born or are created. But I think the very strained circumstances of the Gein household makes an argument that you can turn a child into a monster. Most successful serial killers are the ones who pass undetected. What kind of a man did you know? A rather simple-minded. Bob O'Reilly figured he would get perfectly harmless. Well, a man is a nice man, just like anybody else. The only difference I'd say in the man, he seems to be a little odd. He was looked at as the nerdy kid that his contemporaries would poke fun at, which also tended to confirm for him a lot of his mother's paranoia. Augusta got older, her health failed, uh, she ultimately had a stroke, and she died, and his world collapsed. It seems that that began this downward spiral that totally went out of control. It's quite possible that Eddie Gein had a subclinical psychotic condition that under these precise set of circumstances then manifest itself after her death. And the loss of his mother signified the loss of the final person in his life. One characteristic of schizophrenics that you sometimes find is, you know, they become completely inattentive to their own appearance. And that was reflected in the condition of his house. 
when people broke into it, it was as though he had reversed the normal process of garbage disposal, you know, gone to the dump and brought stuff home. Eddie Gein's house really was a symbolic representation of what was going on in his head. There was total disarray in his head as well, and the house simply was a physical representation of that. He would have radios, even though he couldn't play them since his house did not have electricity. He kept uh, old dentures around. He had a whole collection of chewed up gum, something that was clearly not as horrific, but that is intensely creepy. One of the things he did was to seal off parts of the house. He closed off all the other rooms, the rooms with his mother's things. They were just left exactly as she had left them and uh, moved into just a room and the kitchen, essentially. He enjoyed reading uh, magazines and newspapers and books about people doing rather bizarre things. And one of the interesting things that you find when you look at 1950s culture, there was a lot of very lurid, sensationalistic material. One of the most popular forms of periodical were horror comic books, particularly the Vault of Horror and Tales from the Crypt and so on. They were wonderful stories and beautifully illustrated, but they did contain an extreme level of graphic violence. And they were read not just by kids, but adults as well. People from all walks of life were finding some kind of gratification in the extreme imagery, the slaughterhouse imagery. And of course, there was a lot of material coming out then about Nazi war crimes. I remember just how terrifying it was to pick up even something as mainstream as Life magazine and see all these images of the death camps. He was also very fascinated by stories about South Sea headhunters, stories of 18th century grave robbers, resurrectionists, as they call them. And I think that this clearly fueled his own bizarre behavior. He became really obsessed with these things and finally wanted to act on his obsessions. He started robbing graves. Gein said that he had begun to do this a few years after his mother's death, that he'd suddenly become possessed by the need to go to the cemetery and to remove the corpses of middle-aged women who reminded him of his mother. He would read the obituaries, and then when some woman died, he would go to the graveyard on the night of her burial, when the soil was still very, very fresh and hadn't settled yet, dig it up and pry open the coffin lid, remove the body, bury the coffin again, leaving the grave as he put it in apple pie order, and then take the body back to him and do what he wanted to do with it. Most psychological assessments of Gein concluded that he was trying to bring his mother back he tried to dig up his mother's grave, and apparently when he had gone to the cemetery, he found that he couldn't get at the coffin. Because the soil is so sandy in that part of Wisconsin, coffins are often placed within these concrete vaults. Sigmund Freud would have an absolute field day with Eddie Gein. He really loved and hated his mother because he couldn't have a normal relationship with a woman. He thought that he would take those things that are most significantly associated with a female. He almost seemed to take a glee in creating novel artifacts out of dead bodies. He would make belts made out of nipples. He would cut the genitalia out of females. The investigators found a box full of preserved vulvas, at least one of which was very creepily painted silver and decorated with a little red ribbon. He used human shin bones to prop up a coffee table. He took the tops of skulls and inverted them and used them for soup bowls. He upholstered a chair in human skin. The artifact that resonated most powerfully is the skin suit that he made. He cut the faces off of female corpses and used them as masks. He flayed the top of the torso of one of his victims and also created some leggings. And then began to sew together this parts of skin from various female corpses in a Frankenstein-like way. Gein was very fascinated with the whole notion of transsexualism. And sexualism, there seemed to be part of him that wanted to be a woman. This was his idea of a sex change operation. Apparently, he was not interested in really castrating himself, but thought that he could achieve this transformation by literally donning the skin. He would dress himself up in this horrific skin suit and caper around his property, pretending to be his own mother. There's an ugly paradox, of course, at the center of Ed Gein, because he's trying to keep his mother alive, and yet this is the woman who mistreated him so badly. So he lashes out in rage. He has to cut these bodies up. He doesn't treat them with particular reverence. 
Eventually, the dead bodies weren't enough. He had gone to Warden's hardware store, which was run by a woman named Bernice Warden. It was clear that he was somewhat attracted to her, you know, vaguely the same physical stature of his mother. The day before, Gein had come into the store to check out the price of some antifreeze. Gein went into the hardware store, started examining some rifles, slipped a bullet he had brought along into the chamber of the rifle and shot her in the back of the head. Gein dragged her corpse out the back loaded it into her pickup truck and drove off of it. Later on that afternoon, Bernie Swarden's son, Frank, came back from his hunting trip. He entered the store and was immediately terrified to see this very large streak of blood. When the other sheriffs arrived, they immediately asked Frank if he had any suspicions, and instantly he responded Ed Gein. There was a receipt for antifreeze that was very conspicuously there on the counter. And several law officers, including a guy named Schley, who was the sheriff, had gone to Gein's farmhouse, and the first place they entered was the summer kitchen, which was abutting the main house. They broke down the door, and they started shining their flashlights around, and one of them brushed up against something, and he turned around and beamed his flashlight on it. and it was the gutted body of Bernie Swarden. Gein had hollowed out the carcass completely, basically dressed out like a deer. Schley immediately staggered out and began to vomit at the sight of this thing. They had found her completely gutted and cleaned out carcass, but they didn't know where the internal organs were or where her head was. Her intestines were found wrapped up in a man's suit. Her heart was found in a plastic bag. One of them came upon a burlap sack, and when he opened the sack, steam rose from it immediately, and he realized at once that he had found the head, and he pulled it out, and much to the horror of everybody who saw it, he had taken two ten-penny nails, bent them into hooks, and attached them by a loop of rope and stuck one hook into each of her ears. And he was apparently intending to hang it as a kind of ornament in his house. He was responsible for at least two murders that we know of, Bernice Warden and the killing of a local owner of a tavern named Mary Hogan, who disappeared very mysteriously one day, although it was clear that she had come to a bad end because bullet casings were found in her tavern and a trail of blood leading out of the place. And her disappearance was very much an unsolved mystery for years and years and years. Occasionally, Gein would joke about the fact that Mary Hogan was down at his farm. And of course, nobody took that seriously and just saw that as another example of Gein's bizarre and not very funny sense of humor. But what the investigators discovered in going through Gein's farmhouse, one of them picked up a paper bag at one point, opened it up, lifted out this hank of hair, and attached to it was a face that he immediately recognized as that of Mary Hogan. Back in the 1950s, and especially in small town, America in the 1950s, people had no preparation for this. This was something straight out of hell. The grave robbing, almost in a way, even more than the murders, touched some very, very primitive chord among these people. The notion that their loved ones, the bodies of their loved ones, had been violated in this way. A mysterious fire broke out one morning in Gein's farmhouse and completely obliterated it before it can be turned into a kind of tourist attraction. The very, very strong feeling among most people in town was that it had been deliberately torched by the outraged townspeople. Plainfield was really in the middle of nowhere. Even people in Wisconsin didn't know that it existed. And it suddenly, because of Gein's crime, achieved this terrible notoriety. The media descended en masse on Plainfield. There was a huge story. Ultimately, it was covered as a lead story in Life magazine. It was covered very prominently in Time magazine. It just received this tremendous amount of publicity. And of course, there were people who didn't mind being quoted in the newspapers or seeing their faces in some newsreel. But the general sense in the community was that Gein had inflicted this terrible wound on the reputation of Plainfield. Every little town likes to pride itself on being the birthplace of some celebrity. Plainfield was immediately becoming associated as the home of America's most notorious psychopath. This is something that was not really commonly known. As a matter of fact, the term serial killer didn't come about till many, many years later. 
Most serial killers are psychopaths, which is to say they are very, very, really frighteningly rational people, but people who have no human conscience and no capacity for remorse and who just see other human beings as objects to be manipulated and exploited and used for their own depraved purposes. It's impossible to feel any sort of sympathy for a Ted Bundy or a John Wayne Gacy. They were just out and out monsters. And even though Gein has been turned into a monster in our imaginations. You know, the real man had a, a lot that was very, very, very pitiable and pathetic about him. Very rarely would somebody develop into this kind of a personality without suffering some tremendous abuse themselves. He certainly didn't seem to be schizophrenic in the traditional sense. Most schizophrenics begin to show signs of their mental illness in the early 20s, and it was not until uh, Eddie Gein was even 39 that his mother died, and it was thereafter that he seems to have begun his reign of terror. Gein, as it turned out, was actually psychotic, which meant that he had this very, very, very severe psychological condition in which he was subject to various sorts of hallucinations. He would see things, he would hear things, he would smell things. We do know that there are certain characteristics that we see in the early childhood development. The failure of the individual to develop through the normal psychosexual stages. There's a little boy in most serial killers who are acting on impulses that civilization is supposed to take care of. We don't do that. Also, there's the fact that I think it's a sexual experience for them. Some men ejaculate while they're killing somebody. And it seems like an extreme way to have that pleasure at the cost of somebody else's life. One reason we're so fascinated with characters like Ed Gein is because we can't resist them. His crimes are so horrible, they kind of bypass rationality and grab us in the primitive brain. They are the stuff of uh, classic mythology and fairy tales. You know, there's a kind of folk story that exists all around the world, and folklorists call this sort of story the bloody chamber. And these are stories about places where people are warned not to go. And in all these bloody chamber stories, what is ultimately discovered in this forbidden place, it's a, a room filled with the dismembered body parts of the monster's former victims, and you are next. Ed Gein is the boogeyman. Gein immediately became a kind of figure of legend in folklore, and this took various kinds of forms. It took the form of sick jokes. What's Ed Gein's favorite kind of pastry? You know, lady fingers. What did Gein say when the sheriff arrested him? Have a heart. Not terribly funny, but, you know, obviously rib ticklers in Wisconsin back in the 1950s. There's something very, very malleable about the Gein story that lends itself to constantly being reinterpreted. If you look at Psycho, you know, Psycho, came into being because the horror writer Robert Block was living in Wisconsin at the time that the Gein story broke. And in fact, if you read Psycho at one point, after Norman Bates's arrest, people are always comparing him to Ed Gein. Robert Block's conception of Norman Bates was much closer to Ed Gein than Hitchcock's conception. Hitchcock, for obvious commercial reason, someone wanted to cast attractive, well-known stars. The Norman Bates in the book was a man in his 40s who wore big, thick glasses. He was kind of unattractive. The kind of person nobody would ever dream could be capable of these crimes, and that's, of course, exactly why he got away with them. I began that's, of course, exactly why he got away with them. I began to describe the way I thought Norman Bates should be. His cock smiled, and he said, Anthony Perkins? And I said, absolutely. Even though Stefano did break with the middle-aged, unattractive Norman Bates, I think he created a more powerful icon. The Boy Next Door is infinitely more frightening. The movie came out in the early 60s, but it's really a book that reflects the 1950s, this very, very rigid, puritanical, repressed sexual code, and then lurking underneath this, all of this prurient interest in dirty stuff. That's the aspect of the Gein case that Block and then Hitchcock take from it in creating Psycho, is that schizoid element. The original Texas Chainsaw Massacre does a, a very, very powerful job of evoking that kind of charnel house atmosphere of Gein's living quarters. It is a nightmare, pure and simple, and that's where its power is coming from. <laughs>
because you can't quite make sense of it. This family of cannibals and butchers can't really exist, but here it is, and you gotta face it. There is a little bit of pathos that we feel for Leatherface. It's not the same kind of identification we can have like a more normal looking monster like Norman Bates as played by Anthony Perkins. Leatherface's clan is perhaps an extreme cartoon of the dysfunctional family. So perhaps we feel a little more sympathy or at least pity for Leatherface because we can see what he is the product of. What Silence of the Lambs takes from the Gein case most prominently is the whole skin suit stuff. In The Silence of the Lambs, both the novel and the motion picture, we watch as Buffalo Bill reenacts Ed Gein's crimes. I think it's fascinating how serial killers have become a kind of new American folk hero. These people do things that we would never think of doing, or would we? You know, there's an old saying that we all think criminal thoughts, we just don't all act criminal acts. The virtuous man dreams what the wicked man really does. These people are living out these taboo fantasies, and it's very, very fascinating to us. In a very exaggerated way, they embody qualities of freedom and individuality that are supposed to be at the heart of the American character. They break all the rules. We admire them for that. Gein has really become sort of the seminal psycho of modern time. He is the thing that haunts our childhood fears. He operates on us through the most primitive parts of our brain. To skin their face and put it on your own face is one of the truly sick actions in the history of the human race. He gets our attention, and as long as he does, there will be a place for him in popular culture. <laughs>